Thank you. Thank you. I call Patsy McGlone. Good evening, I am going to call you a Do Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak on this. This is, as the Minister has said, necessary legislation. But before we go there, it is incumbent upon us all to send out our message of sympathy to those who have died as a result of the coronavirus and um, indeed wish those who are currently in hospital being treated uh, a good, full recovery. These are difficult times. The legislation is, is necessary, it is vital. Um, indeed, the actions of some have driven us to the point of it being vital. Um, so, uh, one, I do not intend repeating a lot of things that have been said by others. They have said them very genuinely. And this is, this is a cross party an entire community response, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The one message that is coming across is test, 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 both for key personnel and indeed people. I'll give you the example. <clears throat> I was contacted by a nurse over the weekend. She's at home. She has a sore throat. She had a bit of a cold and she feels like she's recovering now. She's heartbroken that she can't get back in to fulfil her duties in the hospital that employs her. And a simple test could render whether that nurse is able to go back in and fulfil her duties. She sees other colleagues who are off in similar situations, and she sees that test could lead to her going back in. She's committed. She's dedicated. She wants to do her best for society at this time. But that simple test not being done is preventing her or otherwise going back into work. So, Minister, I know you're, you're doing your best, and I would give my sincerest thanks to you and to your department for your activities at this time. But that is one key linchpin that is vital to the success or otherwise of, of what the health service does over the next while, and indeed other key workers too. Um, <clears throat> the, the second thing I would say in relation to uh, health care workers, frontline staff, medical and domiciliary care workers, is first of all, they are deeply valued by us all at this time. But secondly, PPE. Um, many domiciliary care workers in particular have been in touch with me, very many in fact, to say that PPE and the necessary hand wipes that they require moving house to house, as they provide that social uh, linchpin in communities and support for people who are at home, is not available to them yet. Now, I do know that I have been told just this morning that it may be on its way to them. I hope that is the case, and I would implore that the Minister, I know he will do this, uh, because he's grounded in his own communities and sees it as it is too, that that be done ASAP. Um, the domiciliary care workers are concerned that their views and their worries are not being reflected back, and the sooner that is done, the better for them, please, if that could be done. Um, <clears throat> now, I listened very carefully to what the Minister was saying about additional powers. Uh, for the public health agency and a range of powers which is vital. Um, if, you, if the Minister could please uh, advise us if, in fact, those powers will be extended to the likes of, say, environmental health officers and local councils. Uh, the reason for that being is they are probably best placed to evaluate and see what is happening in their locality. Um, I will give you one example, and I am sure the Minister for Agriculture, and Environment and Rural Affairs may well be interested in this too, as it is in the agri-food sector. <clears throat> a lady contacted me last night, and I will read out what she says here. In the past fortnight, the only steps the factory has taken to protect workers is to put up signs about hand washing and install installing hand sanitizer stations. The buses carrying workers to and from work are not practicing social distance guidelines, and the canteen is also operating with no social distancing being observed. The enforcement of this is crucial. That lady is at home. She is the principal carer for her mother. She is the only child. So you can see her mother is not well. You can see what she is going through as to what her husband might or might not bring back into the house. Um, one other thing, and um, I would ask maybe that the Minister check with other government departments, cross departmental, the Public Health Agency to ensure that work carrying been carried out for those departments by contractors that social isolation, including the health estates, and I'll maybe speak to you one to one about that later, Minister, that that work has been carried out in accordance with the proper guidelines, because concerns have been relayed to me this morning that 
contractors and contracts. In some instances, most of them are good, effective workers, uh, but some are simply not complying with social isolation guidelines as they should be. Yep. Forgiving me, and I thank you for raising this point. Indeed, I've had a number of people contact me from very high-profile companies across Northern Ireland in terms of uh, manufacturing this morning, saying exactly what he's saying, that, that social distancing isn't being applied, PPA, PPE isn't being provided, and, and touchscreen computers, keyboards and so on not being sufficiently cleaned on a regular basis, and they are very concerned that there's real uh, possibility of the bug being, being the virus being spread across the manufacturing industry, and I think that message needs to go out. Thank, thanks very much indeed for that, Mr Humphreys. Indeed, uh, the, uh, it's unfortunate that this is coming back to us, but it's a reality that's out there. And the enforcement message, I think as Mr O'Dowd mentioned earlier, the enforcement message must get out there. If it is not being done, people have to be compelled to do it. And if they're not compliant with that, then the necessary rigours of the law must be taken against them. Um, I do see the CEF, the Construction Employers Federation, has come out with a statement this morning around what they would define as the important necessary works, and that maybe gives or distills the situation a bit more effectively for us, because that interpretation of what is what's necessary to one person may not be so necessary in someone else's eyes. Um, I would definitely see health works, um, police stations, and other works of that ilk for, say, the prison service being necessary construction works, definitely. Um, so I'm glad the CEF has distilled that today. Yep. The member for Given Way and his experience is just not in industry, but also in some of those governmental jobs which are not as crucial and urgent at this time. And I would draw his attention to that in the infrastructure department, where at the moment we have traffic wardens that are still on the streets uh, that are engaging with with people as they go about their business, whether it's for pharmacies or essential goods, and also people that are uh, using, um, using their, their car parking machines to put tickets on their car. This, again, is increasing more contact with people. I've asked the Minister of Agriculture to pass on to the Minister for Infrastructure that traffic wardens should essentially be stood down at this time. Uh, they themselves don't want to be putting anybody at risk and themselves at risk in, in doing so. Would the member agree with me? Yes, that, that's very useful, and I'm sure your, your colleague will relay that through, as I will, to the Minister for Infrastructure. Um, we're working through difficult times, and that will require difficult measures, but we're talking about protecting life here. And um, it should not be underestimated the danger of this particular virus. Um, we do need those extraordinary measures, and um, perhaps, to um, uh, it was mentioned earlier if the Minister could tick tack with the Department for Education. My colleague Colin McGrath referred to it. There are areas where there are very, very high intensities of what are referred to as essential workers. Now, I refer particularly to East Tyrone, where many of those people in the schools or who have children at the schools are defined as essential workers in the food sectors, the food, the agri-food sectors, and domiciliary care. Indeed, one school has been in touch with me. It has left them in an impossible position where upwards of 75% of their pupil intake would fall within that category of essential worker. And that's just not viable for schools. Um, uh, perhaps that I've contacted the Department for Education over the weekend. I haven't heard anything back yet, but the pressure's on them too. Just if that could be relayed, because a situation, a hothouse situation, could be potentially created there, which isn't the aim of what the Department of Education is trying to do. But if the schools implemented it, could be the outcome, and um, if that could be related to the to the Department for Education, um, I, I don't intend saying much more, other than just there were many issues have come up that have been touched upon here today. The stresses that this will bring about on the mental health system, um, issues I have no doubt, issues such as domestic abuse, mental health issues within houses and um, within the homes and the implications of that for children. So I realise there's going to be huge pressures and huge stresses on the department. Whatever support any of us can give, we're there to do that. And uh, you can pass on our goodwill to those uh, departments at this difficult time, Minister. Um, just one other thing. Um, this came up at the, the Committee for Justice. There is potential for, uh, on that front, there is potential for uh, early release of prisoners. Um, now, 
The Minister uh, dealt with that yesterday. That may be under consideration for further down the line. Um, the one thing I would say is just that I want to make sure that if that programme goes ahead, there are many people who are in the prison service at the moment, or in uh, inmates within the, the prison sector at the moment, who are suffering from mental health problems, addiction issues, and uh, those types of uh, difficulties. I wouldn't want to see a situation where those people with their vulnerabilities are just dumped out in the street. And it would be crucially important that there be a tick tacking between the health service, which the minister said she, she would undertake to be done, and um, the prison service uh, and the DOJ, obviously, to make sure that that situation doesn't happen and that people find themselves moving from a bad situation into a more difficult situation. So, in conclusion, uh, Minister, I stand as our party does to support the legislative consent motion and again uh, to convey our sincere support to you, to your department, to the healthcare system for what is going to be difficult times uh, ahead. And we appreciate their commitment and dedication uh, for the entire community at this time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed. And I would like to begin by offering my personal condolences to those who have lost loved ones to the virus and also to acknowledge the concerns of, of the broader community at this time. I will be as brief as I, as I possibly can be. And I